Is this thing on? It's, it's very quiet down there. Are you sure that thing's turned up? Really? Okay, well, here goes. Uh, this is the Emergency Awesome Astronomy Broadcast System. Remain calm. Remove all sharp objects. Please return your tray tables to the upright position. Have you or your family been involved in an accident that... No, no, I'm sorry, this folder has definitely got mixed up. I told you we need to prepare and not cut back on these things. Hmm, yeah, I know, but the, we're dealing with the fallout of your penny-pinching. Okay, okay, I'll carry on. This is the Emergency Awesome Astronomy Broadcast System. It's come to our attention that something is going on down there on Earth. Now, the sound on the TV up here is bust, so we've come to the conclusion that Supermarket Sweep has finally hit the big time, and frankly, it was about time, and, and that you're either having the biggest game of hide-and-seek in history, or one of your Earth germs has got a bit fighty, and oh boy, do we Martians know about Earth germs. <laughs> well, in either case, stay off the streets. In either scenario, it would seem to be the winning strategy. What's that? Oh yeah, good idea, good idea. Oh, uh, Ralph says your alcohol won't help you, so pop it outside your front door and we'll collect it and <laughs> safely dispose of it for you. What? Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, good idea. Oh, and chocolate crisps and sundry nibbles are definitely very, very bad for you at this time, so you should add them to the pile and Jenny will ensure that they're safely hoarded. I mean, collected. Well, anyway... <laughs> Looks like you lot aren't going anywhere, so stay put, stay calm, and stay tuned, and we'll do our best to make the end of days as painless and astronomy-filled as possible. It's the least we and you could do, and I really mean that. You sitting there on your 200 rolls of hoarded loo roll, sipping your hand sanitizer and paracetamol <laughs> cocktails, surrounded by three tons of uneaten rotting vegetables while we talk <laughs> astronomy, is probably the least any of us can do to help in these strange times. And... If it is strange you want, then it's strange I have, because... Hello! This is episode 94, part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for April 2020. Joining me in their own self-isolated emergency bunkers are Jenny. Hello! And Ralph. Hello. I've just got a quick um, uh, idea, guys. I wonder whether we should turn this into a bit of a drinking game and ask the um, uh, the listeners to also join in on this by any reference to social distancing, self-isolating, coronavirus or COVID, phrases anything like, under these circumstances, during these times, staying at home, you have to take a drink. And let's face it, no one's driving anywhere, no one's going anywhere, so you've got no excuse for not having mm. a drink in your hand. So if you're listening to this, um, or if we say anything like this, we're all taking a drink, right? Yeah. I, I think that's an excellent idea. I think that's an excellent idea. I am joining that. Um, looking at the script, we ain't going to make it to the end. Nope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so So, um, um, how, how the, uh, everyone well? Yes, well... Yes, all, all doing well so far. Staying away from the earth germs. Everyone's the correct temperature and no, one, no one's coughing. <laughs> no. I think that that means a drink, right? Oh, yeah. yes. Everyone, chin drink. Chin-chin. <laughs> <Chin-chin. laughs> okay, drink. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so so yeah, everyone. It's strange times. Let, let's 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 stay clear of that for a minute. So give everyone a chance <laughs> to pour their drinks. Um, what else? Anything else that um, is, is occurring? Yes, something big in Jen's world. Yeah, yeah. So I've sent the final proofs off for my paper, my first first author paper. <gasps> Ooh. I know. So Ooh. Uh, it's now up on archive. If yes. anyone wants to to go and find it. Um, oh, all those all those years of us talking about archive, and you're now on archive. And now I'm on archive. Yeah, so that's really um, cool. If you just type in my surname, so like Millard and S two Cosmos, it'll come up probably. No. Oh. Um, yeah, so you can go and see my paper and all the hard work I've been doing. It's like almost two years worth of work that paper. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, and the kind of early edition for monthly notices of the royal astronomical society or munras as we say um is is up on their website as well and because i've sent the final proofs off now hopefully by the time this goes up the final final version will be up on the website so yeah that's fun 
How exciting. Oh, you're in monthly notices. That's really cool. I have contributed new knowledge. Look at yes. that. And not yeah. stopping there either. No, I'm ploughing no. ahead with paper two. I am whoop, whoop. most of the way through the first draft um, as we're recording. Should have the first draft completed once um, once this goes out. So yeah, ploughing ahead with that as well. Cool. And then and then some bad news. Bad news. So everyone, you- prepare your drinks. Let's say get your drinks ready, everyone. Unfortunately, <laughs> due to the current situation, uh, Jin Jin. the cradle. The, the Cradle of Aviation Museum event has been cancelled, understandably, because, let's face it, if any of the remaining Apollo astronauts get COVID-19, they are going to die. Drink. So Drink, Jin Jin. I, I, I'm just finishing, I'm finishing this, and then I'm just going to have, like, a few mouthfuls, because I figures <laughs> everyone's going to be stopping every four words. So I'm just going to get this out of my system. How are you doing at home, listeners? I know. Yeah, um, so that, that was... It, it's been it's been a really interesting couple of weeks, wasn't it? Because we we've yeah. been having this on our, on our uh, cushioner back channel. Um, yeah. The 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 kind of conversation of, of Jenny going, is it going to be cancelled? Is it going to be cancelled? Can I? Am I still going? Oh man, it's been cancelled, but my flight just hasn't. Ah, and now my and and then slowly each thing's been cancelled, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah. So my flights have now been cancelled. So I had an email from British Airways. But I've already started claiming for the travel voucher, so I think I'm just going to end up with the mm-hmm. travel voucher rather than a full refund. However, I'm still playing chicken with uh, Airbnb because yeah. uh, <laughs> at the minute, their COVID-19 policy finishes on the 14th of April. So basically, if you've got any bookings between the 14th of March and the 14th of April, then you can get a full refund, no questions asked. We were due to arrive in New York on the 17th of April, so we're three days out of the uh, the target. So um, that'll ch- that'll soon change. Yeah, I know. So it's in these strange times. Drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Right. Yeah, I better, I better catch up on my drinking. So yeah, someone else can talk about good things or bad things because there is something well, very actually, sad well, that we need to we, talk about. I say we've we've got we have got a sad story just just as. Uh, that's not related to that that sure name nameless um is is al warden mm. and of course al warden has uh, has gone off on his final mission and we had him on the show yeah we did we did and and it was one of our most fun and most interesting <laughs> most interesting surreal as yeah interviews i think we've ever done Yes, it um, was a, a, a lovely yeah. chap, and you know, mm. got such wonderful stories to tell of being on Apollo uh, 15, 16, 15. Oh, why can I not remember this? Uh, 14. 15, I don't remember. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. <laughs> 15. Um, How many drinks have you had already? Yeah, well, yeah, quite. Um, and um, you know we had a good sit down chat with him and he'd spent a lot of time in the UK as well so you know he was well acquainted with UK life and, and UK aerospace and we just had a hoot chatting to him and, until it all went a little bit south when he started getting into his numerology and, uh, and aliens living on earth um, but um, as if a reminder that you know these uh, these Apollo astronauts are particularly during mm-hmm. this time are a resource that is very vulnerable uh, and, and, and the reason why things like the Apollo 13 event shouldn't go ahead uh, it's that you know we've lost another one of these Apollo astronauts and they are a dwindling number mm. and a very nice gentlemen most of them are too oh yeah they are it is it is sadly a, a, a race for that that deadline isn't it of will we will we have nobody on earth that's that's been anywhere else before the next thing lands on the moon before mm. before Artemis for instance um, yeah. more on that later um, yeah Oh, oh! By the way, I should say, if anyone wants to hear that interview with him, go back to episode thirty-eight from August twenty fifteen, um, and uh, check out the the words of Al Warden, some of the uh, one of the, the the last interviews that he did. Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Mm. it that's a, that was it was up in Manchester, wasn't it? That's an age ago. Goodness it me! Was. Yeah. Although while we're on the subject of Apollo, mm. we have to talk about Apollo in real time again. Again, that was great during Apollo 11. Oh, man. 
So if you if you missed Apollo in real time when it was the anniversary of Apollo 11, you cannot miss it now for the anniversary of Apollo 13. So they've done it again. What the it's a mm. website, apolloinrealtime.org forward slash 13. And they have digitized all of the audio from the Apollo 13 mission. So you can listen to Capcom, you oh, can listen great. to the astronauts, you can listen to other people in mission control in real time so when you go to the website there's an option for you to listen to mm. what was being said right now you know as of today as you're listening you can go and check out what was happening or you can skip forwards to one minute before oh. launch whoa now when it was the apollo 11 anniversary like i listened to the the launch mm -hmm. you know real time as it would have been and oh my god, I lost hours of work that day, but it was so yeah. worth it. <laughs> and if you if you do want to list that in real time, of course, launch date was eleventh of April. So if you are, if you do want to sort of follow that mission from yes. its actual launch through the mission, then that's the eleventh of April. Um, um, also, and I told you wrong about when the uh, the episode that had Al Warden on it. That was December twenty fifteen. Oh, December twenty fifteen. Uh, okay. And uh, I think Still. we missed out on a couple of drinks earlier when we mentioned uh, a few coronavirus-related things, so chin-chin. Mm. Oh, mine's finished. Do keep up, listener. Oh, I need another one. Oh, I need another one. The the gin has gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> already. Well, while Paul is sorting himself out, I guess because of that which shall not be mentioned... Everyone's probably a little bit bored and looking for things to do. So you, mean just in, kind of, you mean in these in these strange times? Chin chin. Uh, in these in these most normal these, these and difficult, predictable times. Difficult times where where people are stuck at home and these <laughs> normal times. Yeah. So um, I just want to remind the listener that um, Galaxy Zoo is still a thing, mm. and they're going to be a you know fantastic pursuit when you've got a lot of time on your hands. When you've got time on your hands, why not go and do some science? Drink. And you can and do some astronomy. And they've gone back to Mars, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, you can do galaxy stuff, you can do Mars stuff, you can, there's still loads of things to do with animals, you know, so you can you can mix up the science. You can, you can do a bit of biology, do a little bit of astronomy, and, you know, it's a great way to keep yourselves entertained and actually contribute to science mm. in a very, very real way. And it'll make Chris Lintot happy. It will. Yeah. And and Chris Lintot should be happy. Yeah. Who doesn't want Chris Lintot to be happy? Name yourself, whoever it is. Yeah. He needs to be happy. I tell you what, do you know what? And I am going to go and get myself another drink because I have a feeling there's going to be a, a, I'm going to need a lot. <laughs> so I'll be back in a moment. Um, I'm going to the other end of my bunker where my, my stash is kept while Jen does the shout outs and reviews. Yeah. Jen. So, again, you've actually been listening to us when we've been asking you for some reviews. So, I'm just going to give some shout-outs to some people who have have done what we've actually asked you to do. So, uh, yay, thumbs up to all you guys. So, these are all from Apple Podcasts. Um, and we've got... Right. I apologise profusely, because if you ever heard the outtakes, you know that I can't pronounce anything for sh** and uh, the first one is SFG Mulcahy sounds right I think that, that's our good friend Sean Mulcahy yeah if this is you I'm really sorry if that's wrong but you say I love this podcast it's the highlight of my month lovely thanks that's great we also have Steve WGC who says entertaining and informative and the perfect length to listen to on my twice monthly 10k run crikey First of all, very impressive that you could do a 10k run twice a month. I can't even run for 10 seconds, so kudos to you. Uh, Vinny B 67 says, really enjoying the podcast and the presenter's clear love of the subject. It would be easy to get too technical and turn listeners off, but all the presenters strike a great balance. Keep it up. Oh, well, that's nice. We're not, we're not going to be balanced at the end of this. No, I tell you, yeah. <laughs> we're lucky to be upright. Mm. So, Mark underscore G underscore, with specific reference to the Cradle of Aviation podcast extra that you did, Ralph, uh, says, oh, yes. awesome episode. Great, by the way. Peak ah. Ralph, mm. smiley Peak face. Ralph. Keep up, yeah. 
Keep up the great work on the podcasts. Everyone has something new astro-wise and always leaves me sniggering. And that's what we aim for, right? New knowledge and a barrel of laughs. And we should always aim for peak Ralph. Climb peak Ralph. Oh, yes. I think we're going to get the bottom of the barrel, Ralph, tonight, but we <laughs> shall see. And uh, finally, we've got SJB underscore Astro. And this comment was entitled, Best Thing Coming Out of Mars at the Moment. Aww. The podcast, yeah. <laughs> the podcast that makes other shows hold their manhoods cheap. <laughs> oh, nice Shakespeare reference there. Yeah. Very nice. So, thank you all for your reviews. We do pay attention to them. We do like receiving them. Um, so, please mm. keep them coming, and you can get a mention on the show if you do. Marvelous. And I would. I also want to say that um, I know we don't respond to a lot of the emails. We try and get as many as we can on the show, whether it's uh, comments about the show or whether it's questions. And we'll be able to do a bit more of questions as well because if I just take a quick look at my notes here, we are going to do a live Q&A session at 8 p.m. on Thursday the 16th mm -hmm. of April. So if people are sat at home with nothing to do on that date, and you probably will be, um, then <laughs> do tune in at 8 p.m. on the 16th of April. That's a Thursday. We will post details on Twitter and various other places when we know exactly how it's all going to work. So um, keep your eyes peeled, but check out Twitter on the 16th of April. And that'll be 8pm uh, British Summer Time, which is uh, one hour ahead of Universal Time. Um, so work out your time zones from, from there. Five hours ahead of Eastern Time, US, and uh, eight hours ahead of West Coast Time. So it's time for the news, and let's make it largely good, people. Happy things for happy people. Go. Okay, so first up from me is the progress towards Europe's new mega telescope, or the ELT, the imaginatively titled Extremely Large Telescope. And just to show you <laughs> the importance of this, uh, consider that the largest single mirror in any American telescope is 10 metres wide. And the largest single mirror in the world is the Grand Telescopio Canarius at 10.4 metres. The extremely large telescope will have a primary mirror aperture almost four times that at 39.3 metres. So this is an absolute goliath of a telescope. It is insane. It's mental, isn't it? That is mental how big that mirror is. It is, yeah. And most telescopes use two mirrors or three mirrors. Uh, this one has got five precision mirrors, um, or will have when it comes online in 2025. And this month, the critical three-ton tertiary mirror is now built and is going off to be polished to within 15 nanometers of its life. So consider wow. that this mirror is half as large again as Hubble's primary mirror and 12 times the size of Hubble's secondary mirror. Hubble doesn't even have a tertiary mirror for comparison, but combined, the extremely large telescope will have 256 times the light gathering area of the Hubble Space Telescope, and with cutting edge adaptive optics, will grab 16 times sharper images than those of Hubble. Wow. Um, and again, if you want to know more about the extremely large telescope and what it'll be capable of, take a listen to my interview with Dr. Joe Liska from the European Southern Observatory all the way back in episode 38 from August 2015. Um, in fact, we did a series from the Extremely Large Telescope. I remember that interview. That was a great interview. Yeah, I think we were talking about biosignatures and finding life on other planets, weren't we, with that one? Yeah, that was a long, wow, that was a long time ago. Sorry, how smooth did you say the mirror was? 15 nanometers. Right, well, one tenth PV is about 85 to 95 nanometers. So if you've mm -hmm. got a really good mirror at home, this is about five or six times better than that. Yeah, that's kind of what you'd mm. expect, isn't it? Yeah. That's bonkers. Yeah. And it's and it's a lot bigger. Yeah. 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 A lot, lot bigger. <laughs> that's a lot of polishing. <laughs> yeah, get the... Mm. Uh, Get the window lean out. <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon, they, they, do you reckon they, they, they clean it with vinegar? I'd like to think so. And a, and a bit of newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so next up, I've got one of the most bizarre exoplanets, um, and one that's such a cool discovery that the European Southern Observatory's Communication Strategy Officer actually emailed me to ask if I need any more material to announce this in the podcast. And my answer, of course, was, hell no, this one writes itself. Um, so we've already confirmed, uh, I think, more than 4,000 planets around other stars now. Yeah, and- we're well over 4,000 now. And some are bigger than Jupiter, some are like Tatooine in Star Wars, Mm -hmm. some look like water or lava worlds, but this one's probably the weirdest and takes some thinking about because Mm. WASP-76b was studied by the Very Large Telescope in Chile and appears to rain iron. Oh, it's amazing. Not I-O-N, I-R-O-N, iron. As in the metal. Yeah, F-E, yeah. It's insane, isn't it? It's yeah, bonkers, and, isn't it? Yeah, and there's a lot of inference in this, but it's 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 very solid based on modelling and based on what we see um, in on on Earth. That like the moon to the Earth, this planet is tidally locked, and it only ever shows one face. It's day side to its parent star. Uh, its cooler night side remains in perpetual darkness. Now, on its day side it receives thousands of times more radiation from its parent star than the Earth does from the Sun. So it's that hot that molecules separate into atoms and metals like iron evaporate into the atmosphere. The extreme temperature difference then between the day and night sides results in vigorous winds that bring the iron vapour from the ultra-hot day side to the cooler night side where temperatures decrease to around 1500 degrees Celsius and the iron Ooh, condenses moderate. and rains back down. Oh, yeah. Moderate. <laughs> yeah, very moderate. Um, <laughs> to, to those moderate temperatures where iron can just condense and rain down from the sky. <laughs> rain down molten iron rain. Just little, little bullets wow. on top of your head. Wow. That is insane. Oh. Yeah, as Prince would sing, iron rain, iron rain. That is the worst joke we're going to hear all <laughs> evening, isn't it? <laughs> Oh no, they're going to get worse. I was going to say, there's a <laughs> lot more of this episode to go yet. But that's me done. Jenny. So, with the streets getting quieter, drink. Drink. Chin chin. Drink. Drink. In these difficult times with COVID. Drink. Oh God, okay. Don't lick the lampposts, people. <laughs> so while the streets are getting quieter... It looks like the solar system is actually getting busier after the announcement of some new residents in our own back garden. How many newbies have Mm. cropped up, you ask? A dozen? Two dozen? Try almost a dozen dozen. Wow. Astronomers have found 139 more minor planets in the outer edges of the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. Oh, does this mean we can finally kill any attempt to bring Pluto back as a planet. Oh, I know, right? So, this study uses archival data from the Dark Energy Survey between 2013 and 2017, and um, it's mapped over 5,000 square degrees, which is almost a quarter of the southern sky, using a 570 megapixel camera. 570 cool. megapixel camera. Yeah, it's insane. That'd need, that need a big camera bag. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's attached to a four meter telescope in the uh, Chilean Andes. And the data is actually meant to be used to try and figure out what dark energy is, hence the name. You know, that mysterious energy that's caused our universe to expand mm-hmm. at an ever increasing rate. But Or is it? Mm, or is it that? Well, that is the question that they're trying to answer. Reference to another story, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Anyway, back to the minor bodies. The, the images that are produced by the Dark Energy Survey, because they're super high resolution optical images, they're ideal for finding new small bodies in our solar system. And these new objects were found by essentially playing spot the difference with images taken of the same patch of sky over subsequent nights to find what's known as transient objects, so things that aren't static on the sky. Um, and that can be because of their motion or because of their brightness. They whittled, get this, right, seven billion dots down to 22 million transients which were then cut down again to 400 trans-Neptunian object candidates blimey 7 billion to 22 million to 400 it's some (laughs) phenomenal work has gone into this Um, that's a 
it's a lot isn't it and so then they they, that, some... that was a lot of, that that was a lot of back, back of fag packets and pencils that was wasn't it it is insane i mean this is why yeah. people don't do this computers can you imagine having seven billion dots and trying to look at them by hand to figure out <laughs> if they're a planet or not no i don't think so somehow put some coffee i'm getting to work yeah <laughs> <laughs> But so they kind of did some um, further study compared to other data sets. They worked out that 316 of those 400 were trans Neptunian objects, and 139 of them were brand new discoveries. And wow. what's really exciting about this is if, you know, finding nearly a dozen dozen new objects wasn't exciting enough but this research is exactly the sort of work that could lead to the discovery of the long debated planet nine planet nine so as more of these big survey telescopes come online like the vera c rubin telescope mm. which was previously known as the lsst uh, more and more of these are going to be found basically and patterns in their orbits could lead to the inference of giant planets way out in the distant solar system so a very exciting story planet x is back on Yep. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, why, we, why do we call it Planet X? I like that. That's that, That's just Planet X. What's this Planet Nine rubbish? I like Planet yeah. Nine because it calls the argument that Pluto's still a planet. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sticking with the theme of hard to see things, um, but this time I'm going straight for the heart of our galaxy and having a look at Sagittarius A-star. Um, this is a new study which was announced in um, the Astrophysical Journal Letters, and if it's a letter, you know it's good. And this article has announced the discovery of light variations right around the supermassive black hole at the heart of mm. our galaxy, which, you know, sounds pretty mundane, but how about this? These light variations are on the scale of minutes and hours. Ooh! And I think that is absolutely extraordinary, right? Think about it. Just let it sink in. We can detect the light coming from matter encircling the supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy, right? And we can monitor how it changes in brightness over minutes. That's pretty cool. It's phenomenal. That, that is, yeah, that is cool. Right. So this work was carried out using that workhorse of the astronomy world, ALMA, or the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And the team observed Sagittarius A star um, in one minute snapshots at three different wavelengths for 10, 70 minute periods. And they found variations at different scales. Um, one of them actually similar to the innermost stable circular orbit around a black hole of mass about four million solar masses, which is great because that's actually pretty close to the accepted mass of Sagittarius A mm -hmm. star, which mm -hmm. is about two and a half million solar masses. So it means that they're not talking crazy with their results right and they're hoping that in the future if they combine this data with data at other wavelengths such as in the submillimeter the infrared and in the optical um it'll allow models which are des which describe sagittarius a star to be constrained and longer observations may reveal even shorter period fluctuations and even fluctuations with changing periods that could be due to matter being accreted onto the black hole which is basically as close as you can ever get to seeing a black hole. And I think it's this is incredibly exc exciting. In interestingly, though, I, we, we're still waiting for that picture of it, aren't we? We are still waiting for that picture. And that has mm. crossed my mind several times that they haven't published it. It must be such a bugger to reduce. So maybe, mm. maybe this is the sort of stuff that they need. They need extra data in order to be able to make sense of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, final story. Back to planets, um, exoplanets actually. So it's kind of a nice, nice full circle with the news this month. Um, this is oh. a study which has been accepted to be published in uh, Munras Letters, and this is about the surface habitability of Proxima B and whether life could survive the frequent stellar flares that are typical of M dwarf stars. Oh, this is oh yeah. now this this Go on. yeah yeah. So mm. Proxima B is of interest to astronomers because. It orbits in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri, which um, is a red dwarf star, and it just happens to be the closest star to the sun, about four light years away. Now, the planet takes about 11 days to orbit its star, um, and it's got a mass of at least 1.3 times that of Earth. Now, although the proximity of Proxima b is exciting, the fact that it orbits a red dwarf star, that's a bit of a problem. Red dwarf stars mm. are not stable. They have frequent and pretty dramatic flares that can make life on any planets orbiting them just 
not viable, basically, um, even if the temperatures on those planets would be right for liquid water. But this study shows that maybe things are not quite as dire as we once thought they were. God, this changes all the time. Mm. I know, but this I, I like the positive stories at the minute. Mm. So the team models a variety of different plausible atmospheres for Proxima B. Uh, containing carbon dioxide and nitrogen at different pressures. And they found that if you've got an atmosphere like that, it can actually block harmful UV rays from reaching the surface or at least filter out how many of those harmful UV photons get through to the surface. And this is really, really interesting because before we always assumed Mm -hmm. that you'd need an oxygen-rich atmosphere to have a protective UV layer Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. ozone. Mm. So this this is pretty revolutionary. The team also had a look at what would happen if the planet didn't have any sort of protective atmosphere. So if there was no atmosphere, would a flare actually wipe out all of the life on the surface? And it turns out the answer is no. A tiny fraction of microbial life would be able to survive. And yeah, this is subject to a lot of assumptions, right? It depends how frequent the flares are, what sort of gap you have between the flares, um, how long you know would it the bacteria need to sort of build up their population again to some sort of level that would allow them to survive the next flare but they are looking into it and that's going to be in the next study and i love this because it shows just how durable life is even in the most unlikely of circumstances so maybe life is actually way more widespread in the solar system and in the universe than we ever thought Mm -hmm. Especially since that uh, red dwarf stars are the most populous stars uh, out there, and oh, we see yeah. more exoplanets around these, as as you would expect, therefore, than any other type of star. So it's just it's just all round good news oh, for uh, astrobiology. Yeah, and just because I can, I'm going to butt in with a bonus. <laughs> bonus story. Oh yeah, go on then. Do, 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 do. Bonus story. It looks like Beetlejuice's dimming was because of dust, according to latest research. Uh, Someone did some research looking at the surface temperature of Beetlejuice and they figured out that the temperature hasn't cooled enough to account for the amount of dimming that Beetlejuice went through, so they reckon a cloud of dust was almost definitely involved. Which means someone needs to hire me because I made this call like months and months ago when Beetlejuice started dimming so please can someone give me a job because I finished my PhD in six months and I'd like some something to do afterwards <laughs> please yeah I'll have I'll have the extra large fries please <laughs> <laughs> oh god you joke but you never know with the way the economy's going at the minute oh no I don't think Paul's joking <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Uh, because funny enough, that that's what the, I was kind of a little discussion just now. Um, because this was a discussion I was having with with someone um, just the other day. Someone asked me, "Okay, everyone's spending out on this, and this is you're gonna you're gonna get very drunk in the next couple of minutes, people." Um, mm-hmm. Science and astronomy. What do we think might happen over the next few months, years? Given that all kind of economic and funding kind of predictions and things have pretty much just gone out the window. I think everyone take a big drink now and then we'll really <laughs> quits for this section because otherwise everyone's going to be bladdered. Mm-hmm. What do we think? Well, I think the first thing to look at is that the, the biggest impact is going to be where people are congregating and the fact is that in astronomy now people don't need to congregate a great deal in mm-hmm. professional astronomy you know you're using remote telescopes mm-hmm. you're looking at data the big impact i think is going to be on the conferences and people being yeah. able to get together and being able to collaborate together yeah but i what i actually think is that there's going to be a boom for going back over old data and and doing comparisons of data mm-hmm. um and yes, I had this thought too that a lot of people will be sort of going back and data mining and looking at data that they've had but they haven't used because there are plenty of astronomers that I know like they get data from these telescopes and they sit on it for years because they don't have mm. anyone to work on it because they're so busy with admin that they don't have any postdocs or PhD students to actually do their science. And so, yeah, maybe yeah. it will be the time mm. of archival data. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, yeah. I was there's some someone I I follow on Twitter um, was was 
a university lecturer, um, and he was pointing out that actually there's a there's a high chance there won't be any students in September. And by that, like new oh, students, I see, yeah, I hadn't considered that. They, they, they were actually, they won't be, and also because this whole semester has basically essentially been cancelled, that it'll all go back at least a semester, and you won't be mm. looking at getting new students in until next January, and potentially even a year. Um, Maybe and so they'll that, just shift the university year or something. Well, they've talked about it a lot, long time for. Um, so it runs January mm. to Christmas. Mm. They've often talked about that in the past because of exam entry and things like that. So, but it, it was interesting that it was it was little things like that that people haven't we just haven't considered at this point, have we? That because yeah. I mean we we know across industries that this is going to change the way that people work. Mm. Um, mm. Also, show technologically what we are capable of. How little we do need to maybe travel. How. Mm. Uh, it will actually show us what the benefits of all these conventions and exhibitions and events where people get together are. Uh, we'll have to have a rethink of just how you know how beneficial they were. And I think I think in the academic community, they are hugely important. Um, mm. But everything's going to change. Um, we will we will see new ways of working. There'll be a lot more people being able to do a lot more from home because they've tested the bandwidth and they've tested the software. Um, yeah. to the point of failure during this time. And I think that it's it's more the shock of the fact that everybody's had to change their way of working. I think that in professional astronomy, there is no real reason, apart from the building of new new facilities and the maintenance, perhaps, of new facilities, there's not a lot that really needs to change because everything's done so remotely. And mm. as Jenny said so many times before, astronomy, professional astronomy at the moment is mostly data analysis. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Is, the, oh, carry on, Jay. I was just going to say there is this question of because you you raise an interesting point, Paul, about maybe there's not going to be any new students in September, mm. and if there are no students, there's no money, and yes. a significant chunk of university money comes from students and undergraduates and the fees that they pay, and of course then that'll filter through, and if there's no money, then. There won't be PhD mm. students, there won't be postdocs hired, contracts will come to an end and they won't be renewed. And so although maybe there will be all this archival data, is there actually going to be anyone to analyse that data? So so what we're saying is in, in, in the areas like astronomy, especially where, and uh, I don't think I'm being harsh, saying it's not immediately relevant to the crisis that is developing. No, you're um, right. You're absolutely right to say that. And the, that actually we might see a contraction of... Mm. sort of astronomy and and the sort of physical sciences um with perhaps an expansion of the life sciences on the other hand um yeah i mean fortunately astronomers have many transferable skills in terms of mm. data analysis yeah. yeah so that's on the that's on the upside but i was actually speaking to a colleague in baltimore um earlier we were emailing back and forth and you know this whole thing came up as a topic mm. and um they has completely the opposite opinion and that they thought well actually the sciences including astronomy might actually boom after all this because a lot of the go well they're speculating that the government answers to coming out of this recession mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. will inevitably go into because of um this virus that the answer will be to spend 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 and encourage yeah. the economy to grow in that way and so there could be a lot of um government grants and mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. for continuing scientific research so maybe well, that's the thing that concerns me the most that legacy of it the fact that it's not just our economy that's tanking at the moment it is the global economy mm, that's tanking yes. and and i think probably more um, more so than you know that the one that everybody points to as being the big one the great depression in the 1930s um i think I think the legacy of this is going to be austerity for the next 10 years and not being able to fund the sciences and, mm -hmm. you know, unemployment rates at 20 or 30 um, percent. And, and and this may even go on for years if people don't get a handle on it and people be yeah. more sensible and, and stay indoors and stay two meters away from people. Um, mm. You know, the this has the potential to go on and go on and go on until people are more sensible. Um, and... And it could be a decade afterwards before we fully recover to the point where we can be uh, profligate with the amount of money we spend on on research. Which, sadly, I have to say, you know, things like astronomy and the arts are things that government will not 
perhaps see as mm-hmm. the most critical things to fund it will be the uh, engineering sciences um uh, you, you know you can make an argument that um, astronomy isn't it has an engineering aspect to it but government wants to see return on its money and wants to see productivity and growth and so that i would imagine it will be focusing on engineering rather than things like astronomy yeah, yeah. it's going to be it's going to be infrastructure and i mean if if we're looking at more people working at home, more dispersed methods of, of production and 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 essentially proofing ourselves against this sort of thing, then yeah, astronomy is potentially not going to figure much in that kind of spending and funding. I mean, we, we have been saying for the last 10 years that we're in a golden age of astronomy. Mm, mm. And golden age has come to an end. Maybe maybe we have come to that end of the golden age. It will rebuild and it'll come back again. It's mm. just how quickly it happens. Mm. Um, and you, you may find yourself actually in a beneficial position there, Jen, if they're not recruiting more astronomers, uh, not recruiting you know new graduates to, uh, to, to become astronomy researchers, that the ones that, that actually do exist now may be at a premium. Yeah, yeah that's true. It, it's interesting. Uh, may, maybe I will be a precious resource Absolutely. Once, once this all, all comes to the end. I mean, the thing is, even if I can't say in astronomy, hopefully I'll still be able to get a job because I've got all those data analysis skills, mm. right? Because, you know, let's be honest, blobs on a screen, they could be galaxies, they could be bacteria, yeah, they could be cells, yep. and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. tables They're of numbers, tables yeah. of numbers. It, it mm. could be statistics about galaxies, it could also be tables about how many people have been infected by this virus. And it's all about, you know, mm-hmm. finding trends in data. And if astronomers can do anything, they can find you a trend in data. Because, man, is our data messy and nothing ever makes sense. And it's the I think it's the one thing that astronomers are really good at is that they will find you a relation. It might not make any sense straight away, but they will find something that correlates with something else and they'll figure out the science yeah. later. And we, we, Paul and me and John and Damien know, uh, know somebody in London that was an astrophysics student and he now works in the city in, in mm. the financial sector. And in my daily life, I know people, sorry, my working life, I know people that have gone from astrophysics and other mathematical sciences to mm-hmm. go on and work in, in the city and make more money doing that than they, they certainly would oh, yeah. do as, um, uh, as researchers. <coughs> a Hubble diagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, just as something I, I I noted when when we were putting the script together that uh, something I retweeted um, on Awesome a, f- a few days ago that um, various um, groups, sort of like Assassin, for instance, you know, the Assassin Telescope and things were were basically closing down because of this. So they, they couldn't actually they'd have to close the site and things like that. Mm. And they were putting out a request saying actually. Can amateurs step in and keep collecting the data? Yeah, and oh, use their scopes. And and it, it struck me as I was just thinking about this that if if funding is going to to be cut back and, and you know you're not going to get new infrastructure in, in astronomy, you're not going to get the new scopes. You know, you're not going to be able to get the the next generation. You know, the the ELT will get built because it's almost there, but actually you're not going to get anything else after that. Is this actually a greater role for amateurs and, and a time for professionals to engage like far more directly with the public and perhaps even offer some mm. funding and things for data collection because there is some incredible kit out there in amateur hands that with a small amount of money um, and some guidance probably could collect some really really important data for actually yeah. a, not a lot of money yeah what do we think it is an interesting concept it'd be nice to think so I mean, it'll be the amateurs that that take over and keep things ticking because there are mm. some amateurs that they know i mean i call them borderline professional to be honest i mean mm. i would say there are a lot of amateurs out there that know a hell of a lot more about how a telescope operates and how to keep it functioning than professionals do certainly more than i do mm mm-hmm. mm but, but I'll come back to my argument from earlier. What is an astronomer now? Because you're either an engineer building equipment, a theoretical physicist that's devising the art of the possible, or you're a data analyst. Mm. I mean, Jen will be able to answer that question better than, than any of us. But am, am I on the right track there? Is there anything that is unique about an astronomer now? I feel like 
we are more than data analysts because yes we have to analyze the data but then we have to do the scientific interpretation of what the the data means right and i feel like that is where your line between astronomer and data and and blah, blah, blah. that's where your line between astronomer and data analyst is um because you know when we but you, you would still have that scientific method if you were a statistician if you were a professional statistician wouldn't you i mean the, these mm. are all either hard or soft sciences where you have the scientific method built into what the core work is analyzing the data but I, yeah i mean i agree with that but i feel like the line for astronomer is when you are interpreting the astrophysical meaning of the data that you're looking at right that's where mm-hmm. the line of yep. the astronomer is drawn so although yes you know mathematicians and statisticians oh god uh, <laughs> alcohol these drinks are biting aren't they these I drinks know. are biting um, <laughs> i'm drinking cider that's six and a half percent and it's going down very nicely so it's, it's a slight issue when you're trying to say the words Cracky. mathematician followed by statistician anyway granville for fetch a cloth so although yes they are doing you know in interpretation of what their their data is they're they're not interpreting the data in an astrophysical sense and i think that's where you're the line between the astronomer and that comes and also you know astronomers have to do a lot of work before they get their data so it's all about you know writing proposals to be Mm. able to actually get your data in the first place and that requires a hell of a lot of effort and work to sort of come up with an idea convince someone to let you use their telescope in order to test their idea your your idea um Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. then and then do the results there so i feel like astronomers do have a unique skill set um which is different from other sciences but then equally other sciences will have skills that astronomers could only ever dream of but yeah yeah that's where the line for astronomer is drawn well for professional astronomer is drawn anyway and the thing is i think astronomer like amateur astronomers they know a hell of a lot of stuff that professionals don't they especially if they do amateur astro astrophotography and stuff like that man alive because there are some some astronomers that they will never go out to a telescope and actually see it work and kind Mm. of marvel at that massive piece of machinery that's you know unraveling the mysteries of the universe for them some of them will never ever set foot near one and yet Mm. you know there are Mm. amateur astronomers who lovingly craft their own observatories in their garden you know spending literally weeks of their months of their lives you know creating something and, and, and tweaking it until it works absolutely perfectly and yeah i feel like there are definitely skills that amateur astronomers have that more professionals should kind of take note of and incorporate into their own professional lives did you hear that dear listener that mm. is our own astrophysicist saying how wonderful you are absolutely no i i Isn't really it? do mean that i mean there are professional astronomers right you know i work in an astrophysics department in in a good astrophysics department as well cardiff is one of the leading astrophysics departments mm. And um, when it was the um, transit of Venus, Mercury, sorry, when it was the (laughs) transit of Mercury, the recent one, (laughs) the recent one, um, a few months ago, last year, um, you know, I took my solar telescope into work and I was super excited. I was like, I'm going to set it up. We're going to have a look at it. It was cloudy, but we did manage to see a little bit through the clouds, right? And I sent an email out to the whole department, you know, all the staff. And I was like, I'm set up. Come and have a look. Like, so they didn't even have to do anything. They just had to come and have a look. I, I had a handful of mm, professional mm. astronomers, these lecturers, come down to have a look. Mm. And yeah. I feel like they definitely miss out they they lose something along the way. I don't know what it is, but yeah. disappointing, really, isn't it? It is disappointing. It really, really is. And because this was the bread and butter of proper astronomers, mm. you know, 100, yeah. 200 years ago. Yeah, they built their but own telescopes. Tycho Bra would would you know. his nose would spin in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> his golden nose. <laughs> his, his, his metal nose would spin in his grave if he could see astronomers now. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess. To sum it up, in the imme- I mean the immediate now, things are winding down in terms of building. I know that they've stopped work on um, Juiced, mm-hmm. JWST, yeah, um, and and other stuff. Near near future, who knows? Yeah. Long term, let's hope that the powers that be decide that astronomy is worth funding because it turns out great scientists. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll leave it there.
Go for it. Oh, we we got some tweets, oh, yeah, haven't we? Yeah. We we asked for people to tweet in, didn't we? While we were recording this evening, so let's have some tweets. Yep. Oh, we've had some interesting replies. Oh, go for it. Go on, John. Give us some tweets. Oh God, I've been busy googling Zoom. I can't find them that quickly. No, it's <laughs> fine. I've got them. Oh, Jen's on them. Jen, give us some I've tweets. Got them. Jen, I've you're got the closest tweets. we've got to a producer. Yeah. You should have this to hand. I've only got one computer, darling. I've normally got three or four. We've been followed by somebody quite interesting. Have we? Yeah. Like a proper, a proper, proper astronomy. The NRAO, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. That's the job. Go on, Paul. Yeah, we've been followed this evening by the National Radio Astronomy, Astronomy Observatory uh, in Charlottesville. They're clearly they're, they're probably not up to much. So a big shout out to them. <laughs> um, ah, no, I chin think chin. that follow is because of Sean Lynch. Because um, when I retweeted, he tweeted saying, uh, at Autumn Astropod, I'm 1,400 miles from home, picking up my son from college. He's at New Mexico Tech, home of the VLA, the Very Large Array, studying electrical engineering. I was a physics yeah. major there when the NRAO VLA first opened. Oh, um, cool. And he's sent through a picture of some domes um, by the mm. looks of it. And what looks like, now you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like a teeny tiny burger van on site with the telescopes. And I really hope that that is true. <laughs> I've got a look um, now. I've got a look now. Oh, there's loads of tweets. Van. Goodness me. A little burger van. Have a look. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? It does. He, he carries on. It looks like a horse box covered in stars. To say that. The picture is of the student observatories at New Mexico Tech. My son has been volunteering there, repairing scopes, doing star parties and staying out of trouble. That's what he wants you to think. VLA and MRO are on the other side of that mountain. Shout out to them. And there you've seen their shed on the on the right hand side. I know. With the radio image on it. It's so cool. That's really cool. Yeah, so thank you, Sean, and thank you, NRAO. Thank you. For for giving yeah. us a follow. And if you're going to be quarantined, let it be there. Absolutely. Yeah, Goodness I know, me. right? That's and very cool. a big shout out to Sean Lynch's son for repairing the telescopes and doing those star parties and getting people involved in some astronomy. That's what the world needs right now. So good on mm. you. Absolutely. And what else have we got? What else? There we go. We've got Cameron, um, who's at AU Sesquip. Yep, I'd go with sesquip. Yep, sesquip, yep. And he says, the, uh, the recommended amount of alcohol in your hand sanitizer during this crisis is 60% plus. What about mm. in our bloodstream? Can it be higher? <laughs> what, and survive? <laughs> oh. Who, who, do we, who do we know that bats, uh, pangolins aren't your sleeper agents preparing Earth for imminent Martian invasion? I mean... Well... It hasn't been denied, right? Well, you know, we, we, is he trying to suggest that w this is a conspiracy whereby we're trying to get people to dilute their bloodstreams with alcohol to make them weaker? And um, there's really no need. You, you, you know, the ultimate irony. You know, you, mm. you, you fended us off with your bacteria a hundred, hundred odd years ago, and now here you are on your knees with a virus. Yeah. Although, to chip in with that, that sort of you know. How, how much alcohol can you have in your bloodstream there have been people who have been drinking like pure ethanol because they think it'll keep them safe and they've been dying please don't do that oh there's a lot of conspiracy theories around I mean garlic mm. and lemon and even you know there's just some ridiculous ideas of things that will cure coronavirus chin chin I saw someone chop the top off onions and put them in the corner of their rooms because that'll keep them safe apparently isn't that vampires or spiders. I don't know, maybe it works for Martians, but don't it do that. Not. Just stay inside and stop oh. licking things that you shouldn't. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, don't lick anything. When you hear stupidity like that, you do wonder if the virus is actually doing good work. <laughs> <laughs> what, Darwin-wise? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, yeah, no, it's just this, this, the human race, pff, no, it's, it's, reached, yeah. it's reached a dead end. Let's, let's move on. Yeah. It's like maybe, Wally, isn't maybe it? It's I'll, just stupidity and ennui. Natural selection. Natural selection is looking at the chimps, going, "Maybe I'll try with them." <laughs> <laughs> right? Should we? Uh, should we move on then and do some more tweets later? Oh. Yes. We have a sky guide, don't we? Let's do this. Do a sky guide. Mm. 
This month we roar into our astronomy with a cliche heavy intro about this month's constellation, Leo. This constellation <laughs> is of course the main feature of the night sky in the south. Way. Yeah, thank you. Throughout the month as it pads its way across the sky and is Way. clearly clearly the pride of the spring sky. Way. So with clear skies increasingly common as the weather improves, you won't want your scope just lying around, so tails Way. up and leap to it. Way. And there Way. I'll st- there I'll stop before I hurt myself. <laughs> 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 okay, Leo. Well, this is one of those rare constellations that doesn't require some sort of mental gymnastic to see what it purports to be. Um, that said, while we all probably look at the sickle shape on the western side as the head and mane of the te- of the lion, uh, there are many older texts and diagrams that have the lion the other way round, and the sickle is in fact the tail sticking up. It's also one of those constants of the sky in any culture, uh, with few exceptions. If a civilization did astronomy in the past, um, and they were aware of lions... That's what this group of stars has been known as. Um, Artan to the Syrians, there's a lion. Uh, Simha in, in India. And the modern Leo is the Nemean lion, slaughtered by Hercules as one of the uh, the 12 labours. This was the lion that was frankly a bit me too. Uh, lure, you're luring young ladies to its cave and imprisoning them there. Hello. Um, impervious to weapons. Yeah, Kevin Sorbo grabs Leo as he leaps. One hand grabs his front legs, one hand his rear, and he snaps the lions back in two. Freeing the captives. How about that? Hmm. Uh, Zeus, of course, stuck the dead lion in the sky. Sort of an ancient Starlink, if you will. Um, <laughs> if, if you know the uh, the Kevin Sorbo reference, uh, past friend of me recognised. <laughs> I don't, but I'm sure there's lots of listeners that do. <laughs> oh, there'll, there'll be lots of people out there that know exactly what that is. Anyway, it probably doesn't need much of an introduction to location, as it is itself a signpost constellation pointing the way to other constellations, but... Nonetheless, Leo sits in a patch of sky that is looking out of the galaxy, so it's not busy with stars. And as part of the Zodiac, it sits between Cancer and Virgo, uh, two of the most unremarkable constellations in the sky. The two brightest markers are Procyon in Canis Minor, um, that will be in the west after sunset, and Spica in Virgo, which will be in the east, so if you sort of, you know, each side of the sky. And if you look halfway between them, the brightest star right in between the sort of west dead centre between the two is Regulus which is at the base of the sickle of Leo Uh, from Regulus you can trace back to the tail of the line and the star Denebola and you can go up uh, through the reverse question mark of the sickle uh, that makes the lion's head quick shout out for the other lion Leo Minor that sits above Leo just under the rear leg of Ursa Major Ralph, Deep Sky Okay, well Deep Sky observing in Leo can only mean one thing and that is galaxies First off, we have a standalone galaxy just off the nose of our lion in the form of NGC 2903, or the tail of the lion, if you go with Paul's suggestion that it could be Mm. flipped either way. Um, And uh, it is worth taking a look, because you you really can see that. But in classical sense, this is just off the nose of the lion. Uh, And this is actually one of Paul's favourite galaxies, and an almost face-on barred spiral at magnitude 9.7. And it's only 30 million light years away, so one that you can bag in a small scope and in which big scopes can detect some nice detail. To find it, put your find scope on Lambda Leonis right at the western end of the constellation. The galaxy will actually be in the finder scope, but you'll need to move the main scope a little to the south and 2903 should hove into view. Next up, of course, is the crowning glory in Leo, or perhaps better described as the crown jewels, as it hangs down right where the lion's old chap would be. (laughs) And that is, of course, the Leo triplet. Messier 65, 66, and the fainter NGC. Ah, meat and two veg, look at that. (laughs) That, That's one of our greatest outtakes from that non-meteor shower we watched where we went straight through Leo's cock. (laughs) (laughs) It's the gag that just writes itself. (laughs) For more seasoned amateur astronomers, this needs no introduction at all, but it's an absolute must for anyone new to the hobby, as this is one of the real treats of the entire night sky. Because you're seeing three galaxies, all in the same eyepiece view. Look at the lion in its entirety and start with a star at the tail of the lion, Denebola, then move into the next bright star, magnitude 3 Churton, in Leo's groin, drop down two degrees, halfway to the next bright star, Io to Leonis, Keep your eye to the eyepiece and you shouldn't fail to track them down. Swap eyepieces until you get the magnification just right and soak up the view. All month, both these objects will be visible in the southern sky from nightfall to sunrise. Jen? Solar System Roundup time. 
and right at the start of the month so the second the third and the fourth we've got a beautiful conjunction of venus with the pleiades uh which makes this i mean if you haven't noticed venus right like where have you been hiding in your house for some reason <laughs> drink <laughs> drink drink <laughs> But it does, you know, mean that Venus is even more of a target for you guys right now. Um, if you can't get out and observe the start of the month, don't worry, because, you know, Venus, I mean, it's going to be around all month. You can't miss it. You can lean out your windows and have a look at it, right? Not too it's far. It's by far the brightest thing in the night sky. Yeah, don't lean out too far, uh, but stick your head out. Um, it's the brightest thing in the night sky. You're not going to miss it. And to be honest, it's pretty much the only planet that's around right now that's very, very accessible to everyone. Uh, so... You, you know, expect to be revisiting this melting pot of a planet quite a lot in April. Um, but in the middle of the month, we've got a great opportunity to have a look at Ralph and Paul's home planet, Yay. where we are right now. Yay! Um, and also the two largest planets in our solar system. So you've got to get up early. I mean, is anyone getting up early right now? Someone is somewhere. Um, have a look in the southeast just before dawn um, over the... 14th 15th and 16th and the moon is gonna just gently sail past jupiter saturn and mars over the course of those three nights on the 14th you'll have the moon to the right of jupiter on the 15th it's gonna pretty much line up with saturn in the middle and then on the 16th it'll be to the left of mars and so these three nights are a great way to kind of work out which planet is which if you're not sure neptune being chased by the sun right now and because of its faint magnitude basically you're not going to see it and um, the skies just aren't going to get dark enough uh, same for uranus but it's doing the chasing instead um, mercury still technically visible at the start of the month but mm, not easy it's going to be difficult and remember if you do attempt mercury stay safe and never look at the sun directly without any specialist solar equipment so is there anything else interesting uh, i have one about the full moon this month oh go on then it is the closest and so therefore the largest supermoon of the year in April. Um, it's because April's full moon is close to lunar perigee, which is the closest approach of the moon to the Earth. And it means that the full moon is going to be massive and bright. It'll fill the sky. So something to look forward to. Cool. Ralph. We have two meteor showers this month, one for northerners and one for southern hemispherites. First up, chronologically, not to upset the penguins, is the Lyrids. One of the northern hemisphere's best, our first decent meteor shower since midwinter. The Lyrids have a peak optimal rate of only around 18 an hour, but are famous for fireballs and smoke trails. So definitely a shower worth pulling a late nighter for. The Lyrids are active between the 16th and the 25th of the month and peak on the 22nd which is great this year because the moon's completely out of the way all night. The Lyrids are the debris from comet C1861 G1 Thatcher, which has an orbit of 415 years and last passed by Earth in 1861. But the debris it leaves behind makes this the brightest meteor shower from a long period comet. Look between the constellations of Lyra and Hercules in the east and the views should get better as the night goes on. Next, we flip the Earth over and look up from the southern hemisphere with the irregular and frankly bizarre Pi Pupids. This meteor shower runs from the 15th to the 28th of April and peaks on the 24th with a zenithal hourly rate that, well, varies, so we don't really know, but most years it's very low with a flare up roughly every five years. The last good one being in 2017. The cause of this display is the debris from Comet 26P Grig Skellurup, which has a five-year orbit. The radiance of the Pi Pupids is between the two bright stars Canopus and Sirius in the south, which will be nice and high as the sun sets and slowly descends into the western horizon, making this best observed before midnight. And we're crossing our fingers for a good year. As with all meteor showers, no need to concentrate on a particular point in the sky, just lie back on a sun lounger facing the general direction of the radiant and enjoy the show. All that's left is to give you this month's moon phases with first quarter on the 1st, full on the 8th, last on the 14th, new on the 23rd and back to first quarter on the 30th. Clear skies and happy hunting.
Okay, it's time for Jenny to continue her exploration of the electromagnetic spectrum, and this month it's microwave millimeter range. It is. We are doing uh, another long wavelength section of the electromagnetic spectrum, and as Paul said, it's microwaves or the millimeter range. Um, so this show we're going to focus on what we can learn about the universe by studying the skies at these wavelengths and then in the next show we'll talk about key people involved in making astronomy at these wavelengths a success. So microwave or millimetre astronomy. Some aspects of microwave astronomy are not dissimilar to be honest to radio astronomy. Uh, we're still talking very long wavelength radiation and so correspondingly low energy events and cool objects and in this case we're talking about wavelengths of about one meter to a millimeter something like that. So quite often millimeter telescopes are similar to the radio telescopes we discussed last time. Their large arrays of small dishes like ALMA you know the Atacama Large Millimeter Array for once in astronomy. The clue is in the name. And then we've got the VLA, or the Very Large Array, in New Mexico. But you can also have big dishes, right? Big dish telescopes, uh, like the 30-meter IRAM telescope, which is in Sierra Nevada in Spain. But one large difference between observing at microwave wavelengths is that the Earth's atmosphere is actually pretty opaque to a lot of microwaves, and um, particularly the shorter wavelength ones. Microwave radiation is absorbed by molecules in the atmosphere, and this causes them to rotate and vibrate. And I mean, this is not necessarily a terrible thing, because this is how microwaves cook your food, right? By causing water and fat molecules to rotate and generate heat energy. But what this does mean is that microwave telescopes are often placed at high altitude above much of the Earth's atmosphere or in space, which I'll come back to in a bit. So although molecules in the atmosphere absorbing microwave radiation is annoying, it is actually this behaviour that opens up a whole new view onto the universe. Microwave astronomy has been key to detecting molecules in space and helping us unravel what astronomical objects are actually made of. Even though microwave radiation is long wavelength, because we can build massive interferometers or those giant single dish telescopes, just like with radio astronomy, it means we can actually get pretty decent resolution at microwave wavelengths. And to be honest, I'd almost argue that microwave observations might be the most diverse set of observations you can possibly do in astronomy right now. Microwaves can be used to study the universe over, to be honest, pretty much all of cosmic time. So we can start with the right now, or at least, you know, eight minutes in the past, and we can study the upper atmospheric layers of the sun. Uh, microwaves can be used to peer through light obscuring dust and reveal planet forming rings around stars or even tell us the molecular makeup of stellar nurseries or dying stars. And in fact, it was recently discovered that microwave emission from protoplanetary disks, so the disks of gas and dust that are surrounding newborn stars from which planets form, that emission was being caused by spinning nano diamonds in the disks, which I think is awesome. So if we move out now, um, from our own galaxy. Microwaves are a really powerful tool for studying the cores of very active galaxies, revealing powerful jets that can extend far beyond the visual limits of the galaxy. We've discovered literally dozens of molecules in galaxies by using microwaves, ones you might expect, like hydrogen, we talked about that last time, uh, but there's also water, hydrogen cyanide, sulfur dioxide, ammonia, methanol, dozens more. Now, carbon monoxide, which is another molecule which is commonly found in galaxies, is actually pretty key to estimating the amount of star-forming gas in nearby galaxies. It's used as a tracer to work out how much hydrogen gas there is, and detailed maps of carbon monoxide can help us find star-forming regions in other galaxies. We can figure out how the gas of a galaxy is distributed compared to its stars, which can help us build a picture of galaxy structure and why different galaxies look different and what this might mean for their history or for their future. It helps us build a picture of galaxy evolution and helps us understand how the universe that we see today came to be. And the emission from carbon monoxide and dust redshifted into the microwave range has actually helped us find some of the earliest galaxies in the universe, less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And finally, it's microwaves that give us the opportunity to observe the first light emitted by the universe, the cosmic microwave background, released just 380,000 years after the Big Bang itself, and the closest we can come to studying the Big Bang. 
Because this light is so faint and difficult to observe, to get any real detail, CMB telescopes need to be based in space. The absorbing atmosphere is no longer a problem. You're away from any interference and it's easier to keep the telescope stable in terms of temperature. Planck was a two metre diameter mirror telescope which was launched into space and it was the most recent mission to map the entire cosmic microwave background in really exquisite detail. This is an amazing telescope. It was cooled to 0.1 degrees above absolute zero because the temperature of the CMB is minus 270.4 degrees and to get any real detail whatever you study it with has to be super cold. Now where did the CMB come from? So prior to the emission of the CMB the universe was a great big hot soup of protons, electrons and photons all kind of whizzing about knocking into each other and eventually the universe cooled enough for the first atoms to form and this is when light decoupled from matter so they stopped pinging off each other light photons could go off and do their thing the particles could form atoms and when the light first started to stream through the universe it took an imprint of tiny density fluctuations that existed in matter at that time and we see that today in the cosmic microwave background as minute temperature fluctuations now these temperature fluctuations when I say minute, they are really tiny. They're on the order of a few ten thousandths of one degree. And as tiny as they are, unbelievably, these tiny changes are the actual seeds for the first galaxies and the first galaxy clusters. And without these, we wouldn't have all the beautiful structure that we see in the universe today. And we would simply not exist. So finally, I'll finish with a really fun story about how microwaves and astronomers, meh, they don't always mix. Um, for almost two decades, scientists at the Parkes Observatory in New South Wales kept noticing like sporadic bursts of microwave radiation really close to the telescope, but no one could figure out where they were coming from. Um, until one day, they realised they were only measuring these bursts of radiation when the telescope was pointed in the direction of the kitchen and the on-site <laughs> microwave that people were using to heat their lunch which people were opening before the countdown on the microwave was done, releasing a small burst of microwaves. <laughs> so, there you have it. Microwave telescopes are similar in some ways to radio telescopes, in that they can be arrays of smaller dishes or large single-dish telescopes, but they've got to be placed at high altitudes. Microwaves are key for studying molecules in space, helping us understand the gas content of galaxies over much of cosmic history. We can also use microwaves to study the earliest light of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. And finally, never trust an astronomer to cook their own lunch. Gee, Bruntish. Nice one. Right then, it's time for a quick question from our good friend Raphael De Palma in Italy. And he says, do you think Comet C2019Y4 brackets Atlas is going to be bright enough to be spotted with the naked eye? Ooh, well, this is... Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Before we go, we've got to do the cliche. Comets are are like like cats. cats. Are like cats. They have tails and do what they like. Right, now we can move on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's it's law. You have to say that, don't you, when it comes to comets and predictions? Of course you do. Of course you do. So yes. So the first. So to to do this in nice, simple, clear, easy to understand way, we expect it will unless it breaks up. So the predictions mm. are at the moment we're looking at it. It's probably around about magnitude ten in the sky. Yep. And Paul's been looking at it recently, yep. and it was requiring a yep. good telescope to do that. that. Yep. We're expecting it to um, brighten significantly to the point where by around the 30th of May, when it reaches its peak brightness, it should be magnitude minus 0.8. So that should be super Ooh. bright, certainly brighter than so exciting. stars mm. like Vega. Mm. Um, so yes, we do expect it will be bright. However, there is every chance it could break up, or uh, it just doesn't get as bright as the the predicted curve um, suggests. So if it continues in this vein, yes, very much naked eye, a very gorgeous comet. But comets are like cats, and they do what they want. Yeah, and of course, I mean, you know, 
it's the end of days. Of course there'd be a comet. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Of course there would be a flipping comet. <laughs> we've had the locusts, we've had the plague, now we have a comet Drink. for ten days. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, just, yeah, I looked at it um, two days ago. Two days ago, and I thought, this, this, I've had a couple of hours, well, I've got lots of time at the moment, um, thought I'll, I'll put up the five-inch Mac, have a quick sort of play around the sky. Couldn't see it in the five-inch Mac. Lots of people would claim... As Damien was saying, what the hell are you doing using a Mac for Yeah, a well, I thought I'd have a go. I've seen comments in a Mac before. It's, I thought I'll have a little bash. Um, even tried the binoculars. Couldn't see anything. A little sweep. Because lots of people claiming it was binocular brightness. I'm like, mm, no, give it a little sweep. Got the 10-inch dob out. Found it. Overlooked it several times. It's quite easy to overlook. Could then see it in the five-inch Mac once I knew exactly where it was. So once once you know where it is, right. you can then see it in a smaller scope. But you need a bigger scope at the moment to to kind of track it down. Um, it is small and it's got very low surface brightness. Now, in fact, Dave Woodford's just just tweeted and said he's he's needed a fourteen inch to see it this evening. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. So well within the um, the range of John's dob then. Yeah, oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've got a good view of it. And, and it's, it's got a nice little bright core. You can see there's a little nucleus. There's a little bit of fluff around it. Can't discern any tail. I think images are pulling out a little tail at the moment, but there's you can't visually see a tail at the moment. Um, but, yeah. Um, but, but maybe give it a month. Come May, we could all be looking up at it from our, our... Our... Deathbeds. From our beds, from our ventilators. So... Drink. Drink. <laughs> Chin chin. So, should we do a few more tweets before we yes, finish? Yes, let's do some tweets. Why not? Uh, okay, so we've got Kevin Morgan, who is at Miss UK, says, At Autosmashapod, you lot finished yet? <laughs> no. Just about. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> and do you know what? He tweeted that episode. an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Blix, Blix Buller, um, at Skysurfer77x, he says, Thanks for your effort with this awesome podcast. Stay healthy, um, including the... The crowd, the crowd, dot 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 something. Um, cheers to gin, beer, and almudula. I assume. No arm doodler. Um, oh my god! Have you ever had arm doodler? It is the drink of gods. It's amazing. What is it? <laughs> what is it? Arm doodler is an Austrian fizzy drink like pop. It's not alcoholic, but it doesn't taste like any other pop. And oh you my god, I love it. It's like my cocaine. You would have. Like, I will drink that thing by the. Bucket. You would have loved the nineties. We oh man, I grew up in the nineties. Yeah, not 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 grew up grew up in the nineties. You would have loved Alco Pops. Oh. <laughs> man alive, Hooch twenty twenty. Is it? Does it count if I put vodka in Sunny D? Does that count? <laughs> <is> that <thing? laughs> and then um, who else we got? Um, oh, uh, averted. We've got averted vision. Averted vision with a Z says hi guys and Jen. Love the show. First time caller, long time listener here. Ooh. Well, oh, well, hello, averted like vision. Uh, just wanted to say thanks for putting these great podcasts together twice a month. I really do look forward to them. Please keep it up through these strange times. Hashtag us. Well, we weren't. <laughs> We we weren't even asking for praise. We just wanted a bit of engagement so mm. that you guys feel loved Aww. during the uh, the time that we're recording in these end times. But um, but uh, you know we'll gratefully accept your uh, your praise. But um, it's just about you guys, really. What are you up to? And Seamaster uh, Seamaster yeah. GMT he says, "What is an off license? You silly Brits and the funny names for your stores." Oh, what's an off license? <laughs> oh, an off an license. An off license is like a liquor store that also sells newspapers, chocolate, and, mm. uh, confectionery, cigars, and basic essentials. Yeah, it's basically, yeah. if you want cigars, pipe tobacco, wine, beer, all kinds of booze, and yeah. And my local ones just shut down, unfortunately. The bloke retired. Uh, so basically, in the UK, we have lots of mini mini marts which means that you can get pretty much anything you want from a single shop and there's probably one every four five hundred meters apart in the uk which is brilliant and then when we go to america we're like why can i not get a sandwich and a cigar in the same place yeah yeah and, and, and a <laughs> yeah pack of beer and, and a bottle of scotch and yeah <laughs> mm. and some cat food exactly but yeah an off license and, and a packet of it's, it's a liquor store Essentially, with with added things, it's like a small Seven Eleven. It's a liquor store with snacks. Yeah, 
not added things, just like confectionery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, they don't add things. No, no, no. There's, there's no <laughs> additional things. I mean, maybe they do, and we just don't know. <laughs> well, that's great. Starts with an earthquake, birds and snakes, an aeroplane, and Lenny Bruce is not afraid. I have a hurricane. Listen to yourself, churn. World serves its own needs. Don't misserve your own needs. Speed it up a notch. Speed, grunt, no strength. The ladder starts to clatter with fear of height, down height. Wire in fire. Represent the seven games and a government for hire and a combat site. Lefter. Wasn't coming in a hurry. With the furies breathing down your neck. Team by team. Reporters baffled. Trump. Tethered crop. Look at that low plane. Fine then. Oh. Uh -oh. Overflow, population, common food. But I'll do. Save yourself, serve yourself. World serves its own needs. Listen to your heart bleed. Tell me, with the rapture and the reverent in the right, right, your vitriolic, patriotic slam fight, bright light. Feeling pretty psyched. It's the... No, I'm not going to say it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Drink. Mm. Sorry if the audio quality is a bit poor, but get used to it. We're not going back into the studio anytime soon. But because we know you're open to anything remotely entertaining at the moment, we'll have a couple of live recordings for you. So on the Thursday, the 16th of April, 8pm, we'll have a special live Q&A. And the next time we record the main shows, we'll probably be recording live, and that will be on Monday the 27th of April, again at 8pm. So, just go along to our website homepage, awesomeastronomy.com, our YouTube channel, Facebook page or Twitter feed on the 16th of April for a link to our interactive live Q&A stream, and then again on the 27th of April when we'll record our next Astronomy Live show. We'll kick off at 8pm UK time, that's midday Pacific time, 3pm Eastern time and 9pm Central European time. We'll make everything as easy as possible for you with a single link to click to take part if possible and you'll be able to send us questions to answer or comments to read out. So join us then. So until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.